Howdy, folks, and welcome to the Jason Wright Show's Best Friday Ever. I hope this week has been stellar for you. Summer is definitely here. It's freaking hot. My goodness, I'm reminded of that scene from uh, from Good Morning Vietnam where, uh, I can't remember, I think his name was Roosevelt or something like that, one of the characters that Adrian Cronauer played by Robin Williams, the comedic genius that he was, this uber-talent, uber-talented, Juilliard-trained actor, by the way, a little sideline trivia here for you. Did you know that Robin Williams was the roommate of Christopher Reeve at Juilliard? I think I've got that right. I don't know how that jumped in. I'm a plethora. I'm just I'm, I'm a cornucopia of absolutely useless trivia. So tune in to the Jason Wright Show for my useless trivia. Well, anyway, I'm I'm reminded of that scene from Good Morning Vietnam where he's doing the weather report on his radio show and uh, he has this guy call in. He said, uh, "He said, what's the weather like out there?" He said, "It's hot. It's damn hot." And uh, and it is damn hot in uh, in Texas. However, though, I was out early this morning, a little after the sun came up, reading on our back patio, and it was pretty nice. I got to tell you, it was one of those rare instances here lately where you have a little bit of a cool cool weather or at least a little reprieve from this massive heat. Tell you what's been kind of crappy, to be honest with you. I got spoiled during this uh, really cold winter that we had, at least there for a while, where my ice barrel would, like, ice over. That was money. That was so money. I mean, I would literally have to, like, break the ice off the top. Well, that's not the case now. It's like a warm bath. So... I want to, and I want to tell you just as a consumer, okay, those of you, because a lot of you ask me about ice baths, the benefits, why you do it, and there's a whole host of reasons. It helps with a whole host of reasons, such as insulin sensitivity, uh, it raises your serotonin levels, it gets your endorphins going, it's a great, it's just a great practice for a whole lot of reasons to help strengthen your immune system. You can check that out later. That's not the point of this particular segment as it relates to cold thermogenesis baths. Uh, I, this is a consumer. So Jimelin, Mrs. Wright, got me the ice barrel. And I wish I had a picture on it. Maybe I'll put in the show notes a, a link to it. She got me a, a, the ice barrel for Christmas. And I love it. And in the winter, it is spectacular. But really, all this thing is a giant plastic barrel. That's literally all it is. So whenever you're having 100 plus days on end, you know, in Texas, then it doesn't, it's really kind of hard to keep the water cold. And so you think, well, just go, first of all, the idea to go buy a bunch of bags of ice. Well, the first time before it even got really, really hot, I think the first time I ever used it, I had, um, or that, that it was kind of warm when I used it, I had four bags of ice I put in there, didn't really make a dent. I think I might have got it down to like 75 degrees, which is nothing. And then I just had an ice machine installed so I could make my own ice and put in there. And it takes every bit of that ice and then some to even get it to kind of get almost to 70 degrees, which gives you a nice little chill. But, I mean, come on, 70 degrees is nothing. You really want to be somewhere. I prefer as close to freezing as possible. Uh, But, you know, just for everyday use, then if you can get somewhere between 40 and 50 degrees, that's going to give you a nice little cold pop. It's going to get get your body to react the way that you want to to get the true benefits of thermogenesis. And so if you're shopping right now, there's several options you can do. You can get the ice barrel. Again, I'll link to that in the show notes. Uh, but there's also this other contraption that uh, Mike Mutzel, Ben Greenfield, all the fancy people are using. And it's like 10 grand. And I'll be honest with you, it looks like a, a, a wooden encased uh, feeding trough is what it is. And so, and I'm sure it's spectacular. I mean, it looks really nice, and it, and it regulates the water. It ke- you can keep it at a set, a steady 32 degrees, but that's kind of money. But I'm not even going to go into all the other different ones. There's a, they're, they're popping up everywhere now, the cold plunges. But I'll just tell you, as someone who owns the ice barrel, a major engineering flaw is this thing is nothing but a plastic barrel. It has no insulation whatsoever. So if you live in one of the western states or in the kind of in the middle country of the country, I guess in California where it stays kind of cool, this could be a good product. Or up in the Pacific Northwest, or maybe even in the East, it gets it gets hot enough that I just I don't know what they were thinking. There are so many slight changes they could have made to the design of this thing 
to where it would actually stay cold? I mean, for God's sake, how long has Igloo been making coolers? All you did was make a giant freaking barrel. You couldn't look at the Igloo cooler and go, huh, I wonder if we should do something like that so that these people can have one load of ice last more than the five freaking minutes that they're in the barrel. So that's my comments to you, ice barrel people. I love your product when it's really cold. I love your big, giant plastic barrel that you charge over $1,000 for. Uh, but really, you could up your game on that deal. Mrs. Wright, I love you, and I'm so grateful that you got me the ice barrel. She has no clue about these products. She just knew that I wanted a, something to to do my ice baths. Uh, you can also make one out of a uh, of an old freezer that always freaked me out it scared me though i don't care if it's not plugged in or whatever that's what aubrey marcus i saw his his i think mike mutzel did this all these guys a lot of them they start out with going to home depot and getting a cheap freezer my cost effective way of doing this was the ice barrel that mrs wright got me and then go buy i think i got this ice machine for like four hundred dollars online uh it was uh and it, and it does it makes like i think it makes Maybe 100 pounds of ice every, I don't know, a few hours, something like that. But it's, it's pretty sweet. It's, a, it's great. So all in, I'm at like 1500 bucks still for my ice baths, whereas if you buy one of the really fancy ones, you're looking at, I've seen them anywhere from 3000 up to the Mercedes Benz of ice plunge uh, baths for uh, – I was not around $10,000. And again, I'll link to those. I'll just put a few of them in the show notes. I didn't even mean to get on, get on that. Just thinking about the cold, I mean the hot rather, made me think about that. So anyway, uh, all right, before we really get into today's topic, I want to talk to you about my new book, The Stone Chiseler. It is out there and it has been approved for Audible. So you will be able to listen to the audio version of it. And for those of you who... All you can take of my hick East Texas accent is what you get on the Jason Wright Show. And so, therefore, the thought of listening to, I think the book came in at three hours and on Audible. So, three hours of my voice. Don't worry. Don't worry. It's not my voice. I hired an incredibly talented um, reader to, uh, to read the book, and he just crushed it. He did such a great job. He captured the uh, voice of the main character, Giovanni. Cristiani, as well as his mentor, so very well. And just a little bit about this book. So the book was inspired by Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. And if you haven't read this book, the Man's Search for Meaning, that is, I highly recommend it. Look, here's the deal. We all are going to deal with some sort of major struggle in our lives. But the good news is we're probably not going to deal with the kind of struggles that Viktor Frankl did. He was ripped from his uh, his uh, his practice as a clinical psychologist in Austria during World War II, or right before World War II, actually, whenever uh, the Nazis started rounding up all of the, the Jewish people and putting them in concentration camps. He and his wife were separated. His wife and unborn child would not survive the Holocaust, but what did survive was Viktor Frankl as well as his theory on logotherapy. So what is logotherapy? Well, logotherapy is a contrast to Freudian philosophy, which is this. Freud believed that humans exist for one reason, or we're after one reason, that's pleasure. We live to receive pleasure. Viktor Frankl, he surmised that that is not true, that we actually live for purpose. If a human can attach a purpose not only to their life, but each moment, for example, if you are stricken with cancer or your child or something horrible, or you find yourself in Auschwitz in a, in a Nazi concentration camp, if you can find purpose and meaning in that moment and apply it to your life, your sense of worth and your ability to survive and your ability to make something of that moment greatly increases. And that's why you find these, if you look at the statistics on men in particular who do not have a solid vocation, they have, if let's say, like to me, this is the recipe for a guy wrapping his lips around a 44 Magnum, okay? Not to be too crass, but this is the recipe. He has no job. He has no spouse. He has no, no close friends. He lives alone, rarely socializes, so a lot of isolation, 
okay? He had had the potential to do a lot of things, but has reached a point in life where it has seemingly all passed him by. In other words, this is a man that is completely listless. That is a man that, does, that is lacking purpose. Now, he has a purpose. We all do. We all have a purpose. But this individual can quickly determine they have no purpose in this life, and so therefore, they're going to become depressed. They are absolutely at risk of suicide. And this is what Viktor Frankl noticed. As a matter of fact, t- taking on the message of suicide with, uh, with the concentration camps. It, he said that it was remarkable how even in these horrible, horrible circumstances that they were in, the attempts to take their own lives was very rare. You see, because most everyone that was in these concentration camps, they at least had the purpose of surviving for one day reuniting with their family on the other side. So there was some purpose in this, even though it seemed like everything had been stripped from them. Now, you contrast that with whenever the war was over, and in Austria, they really boosted the welfare system. And this is from Viktor Frankl's words and stuff. You can do a YouTube search. Maybe I'll, if I can remember all these things I'm saying, I'll, I'm going to link to. Maybe I'll link to this. I actually have this particular video in one of my courses on finding your why. Having to try, I have a course that includes a section on trying to find your own purpose and identifying your purpose in life. And there's a video from Viktor Frankl that I include in that, and where he talks about in Austria after the war. The, the welfare state expanded immensely. And so what happened was you had a lot of young teenagers that were no longer having to work. Most of their needs were being met, and therefore there was no struggle. And Viktor Frankl always contended that we as humans, we need struggle. Struggle is one of the greatest means of survival and finding purpose and growing as human beings. And he said that, As a result of that, suicide rates started to increase amongst teenagers. Now, isn't that odd? You have prisoners that are at Auschwitz, in Nazi concentration camps, not committing suicide. Teenagers, free, having their needs met, not having to work to support themselves, committing suicide. It's kind of crazy. Well, these are the things he looked at. And so... Understanding logotherapy and the research that I've done on that and reading Man's Search for Meaning, I wrote The Stone Chiseler. It's a parable about a young man named Giovanni Cristiani who has everything that is important to him, everything he holds dear at a very, very young age. It's stripped from him. And so he himself is faced with this proposition of finding his purpose. Who will he become if he is just destined to live in the stone yards chiseling away at a boulder for the rest of his life, fruitlessly, without aim, without purpose. What possible meaning and purpose could his life have? Well, fortunately, Giovanni is met by a mentor, and he helps him discover his purpose. Even in these most horrible of circumstances, and so that's what the book is about. I won't give you too much away, but uh, the the folks that I've had uh, read it, including my daughter, who is a voracious reader, and she uh, we, we were on vacation, and she decided, for old man's sake, you know, to be kind, she was going to read The Stone Chisel, probably not exactly the genre that she would choose. And and yes, she's my daughter. She has a, a biased opinion, but I know when Abby's, uh, and look, she's my daughter, so I know whenever she's uh, full of crap and whenever she's real, and she loved the book. Mrs. Wright loved the book. In fact, in fact Mrs. Wright, uh, it brought her to tears a couple of times, you know. It was, it's that, and, and it's not because I wrote it. It's like, it's just the story came to me, and I think the reason, the, the thing that makes it good is not my writing for sure. The thing that makes this story good is that it's, all of us can relate. We have all had that giant boulder in front of us, and we have our mind, and and we have a metaphorical chisel in our hand, and we, we, we all get to decide, are we going to let that boulder own us, or are we going to take possession in our mind of that boulder, and instead of just chiseling away at the boulder fruitlessly, we decide to become a sculptor, and that is what this story is about. Giovanni Cristiani has to make this decision. Will he just chisel away aimlessly at the boulder, or will he 
decide to chisel the man that he ultimately will become. So that is The Stone Chiseler. I do hope that you will check it out. So I'm reading this book right now by Daniel Pink that is phenomenal. I am doing research on regret. I don't know about you, but one of the things that I want to make sure happens to me whenever I reach 105, which I absolutely plan to, unless I get struck by lightning, unless I get hit by a bus, unless something really, really bad and weird and out of the ordinary happens, I plan to be here for a long time. And I don't want to be in a position where I'm looking back at life and going, why didn't I? If only I had. I ought to have. So I'm reading this book uh, about the value of regret, it's, which is really weird because you know we, we think of regret, and it's, it's interesting. As I've done the research, and some of you have seen my post, I'm going to continue. If you, if you would, if you hear this, uh, shoot me an email at jason at texttitans.com or go on to jasonrightnow.com, the contact sheet, and just you know do something. Give me a give me a subject line that says you know regret question. Or if you are uh, on Instagram and you find me at Jason Right Now or at Jason Right TX on Twitter, at Jason Right TX on Facebook, DM me. I, I want to know some of your regrets because I'm kind of categorizing these things and seeing if the people that I know and that I interact with, it matches this thing that was called the National Regret Survey. And what I'm finding is this. This may strike some of you as kind of odd. Now, a lot of people will say, I have no regrets. I have no regrets. Well, it, on the surface, I get that sentiment, and the book covers that. However, if you're someone that just has absolutely no regrets, if you say, I don't regret anything, the good, the bad, all that I've done, it was just part of my life, I don't regret it, well, that makes, kind of makes you a psychopath. If you have cheated on your wife, lost your family, or you have become a drug addict, and you've stolen, you've killed, you've done some really horrible things, and you have no regrets for that, okay, you're a psychopath. So the people that want to say, I have no regrets, eh, or like Scotty P, no regrets, you know, as his tattoo read, then, you know, really think before you answer that question. Because here's the thing. What the book talks about is how beneficial regrets can actually be. But here's the one I want to hone in on today. As you look at the different categories of regret, and there and there are multiple categories, and I'm actually going to do a full book review on this book by, uh, by Daniel Pink, Eventually, so you'll get all this. And I hope you'll check it back, check it back, and it, and just take my word for it. I think everyone should should read this, especially if you're uh, someone that is like my age. I'm I'm, at, I'm 47 years old, so I'm almost to the midpoint of my life. Most likely, I know that the actuarials would say that I am at the midpoint, but the actuarials don't account for my amazing health and the fact that I work out with Ben Greenfield in my garage and I eat well and I don't drink and I don't smoke and I do everything to take care of myself. So. I am not at the midpoint of my life. I'm probably somewhere almost to the midpoint, but not quite. So anyway, if you are where I am, here's the cool thing about being at this point in life is a lot of the oddas you still have, like you've lived your life. I've lived my life, and we've had regrets because of the shouldas. I should have done that. I should have done that. And those are harsh. Those are harsh regrets that we carry with us. And then there's also the uh, like the moral regrets. I cheated on a spouse. I stole. I, uh, I I did something that we had that our moral code we violated, right? And those are surprisingly widely varied because our morals are all kind of we have some you know, differences, but we've got kind of the same ones. But there's some things that you think are horrible and that I don't think are horrible and vice versa. So the moral ones are not, believe it or not, the greatest regrets that people have in life. So it kind of narrows down to these should'ves and the oughtas. And of all of them that have the most present weight with regard to taking up real estate in our emotions and our mind are the oughtas. And here's why. Well, before I get to the oughtas, let's talk about the shouldas. So the moral mistakes or the, the, the bold moves you made. Let's say you started a business and it failed. You went bankrupt. You may regret that, but that doesn't hold a lot of power. You know why? Because you took action. You saw an opportunity. You took it. It failed. And you, you kind of regret it. I, mean, I can relate to this uh, in 
like with my, I ran for Congress one time and I lost. And so there are days when I look back and I regret it because I'm like, why did I even do that? It was a lot of money, a lot of energy. Uh, it just wasn't good. Uh, but as I look back on it, that's not a, that doesn't even rank in my top 10 of regrets because now it eliminated the what if. I will ne- it never was able to have become a shoulda because I did, right? I, I ran. And so I don't have it as regret. Like, and that's what I did. I remember at that time, that's one of the main reasons why I did it is because I didn't want to get to a point in my life and go, I should have done that. See, shouldas, they leave open the prospect that success could have been attained. And the thing is, we'll never know. But we always look back on it, with reminding ourselves that the potential of success was there and we will never know. So that, that gives it power throughout the rest of our lives. It's really hard to just go, yep, I don't regret that I didn't do that thing that I really should have done. I don't regret that I didn't go to, and and here's the thing, those of you who are like, no, not me, bro, I got no regrets, none. I live in large, I'm living for the now, I'm like Don Draper Madman, I'm living for tomorrow, I'm living like there's no tomorrow because there's not, boom, no regrets. Okay, well, you know, the fact that you didn't go see your grandmother one last time before she drew her last breath while she was in the nursing home dying of cancer, even though you totally could have gone to see her and give her a hug, and she had told every family member, she told your mom, she told your dad, I just want to see him one last time, tell him, tell him I love him, tell him, you know, tell him Nana, would love to see him, and the fact that you don't have an ounce of regret, you know you should have done that thing, you know you had the potential, you know you could have and you didn't do it, and you have no regrets about that, well, Hoss, I hope I, I hope you and I never become friends, because you're kind of a jackass. That's the point. Those are the shouldas. It's not just about, you know, well, I could have done this job. I could have done that, but I did this one. No regrets. Great. That's fine. But look a little deeper. Okay? So those are the shouldas, and they live with us for a long time because we know that there was an opportunity we didn't take. Then there are the oughtas. These are the real big ones, it turns out, according to the survey. And... Think about that. So let that settle for a minute. Why would an auto have so much power? Well, because if it's an auto, there's a presence to it, right? It means there's an opportunity. So, for example, let's say that you don't have the best of relationships with your mom, with your dad, with an old friend. Let's say that a, a friendship, you know, for some reason, it blew up. And this is something, too. There's there's two different categories of friendship uh, breakups, a riff and a drift, going adrift or having a riff, right? So you get in a big blow-up, you get in a fight, boom, relationship, friendship ends. And so now you're living, and time has healed the wounds. It's kind of in the past, and you're going, hmm, well, what, 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 should I? Should I call them, or would that be weird? All right, well, it turns out that the easiest friendships, the easiest auto to, to get rid of are those that you had the big riff. You had the fight. Because it's, it makes more sense to call up, and there's, there's kind of like, like if Liam and Noel Gallagher finally got, you know, and, and I, to be honest with you, now, kind of sidebar here. So if you don't know who that is, then I'm, I'm sorry. I don't, know, I don't know who you are, but they are the, uh, Noel, the founder of one of the greatest, if not the greatest rock band of all time, and according to Liam and probably Noel, the greatest rock band of all time, Oasis, they're brothers, and they famously despise one another. And they, they got into a riff, and, they, and boom, Oasis went away. Both of these guys are living in Auda. I guarantee you, at some point, Probably Liam more than Noel. I know I'm giving you way more Oasis backstory and trivia than any of you probably care about, but probably Liam more than Noel because Liam has said it. They know they ought to reconcile, not for their fans, not for Oasis, but they're freaking brothers, and they publicly hate each other. They publicly don't talk, so they have a big ought to. And they also have an anchoring event and a lot of events after that to go, all right, look, I'm giving you a call, mate. Let's let's talk about this. Let's let's just put. The, I know this is what we need to do. However, what about the adrift? Not the rift, but the adrift. You've got a friend that y'all were really close. I mean, y'all hung out all the time. You you were buds. You know that iron sharpening iron thing. And then just something happened. You just kind of drifted apart. Well, and you haven't talked to him in say a year or two. 
Well, most people won't make that call because they feel weird. There's like, it's kind of creepy just calling this person that you used to be really good friends with two years ago and like all of a sudden, hey, bud, what's up? Because a lot of things happen. First of all, by making the call, you're admitting, hey, I know we used to be close. That's why I'm making the call. I also know we kind of just lost value of this friendship. So, hey, what's up? So, that's so it's the rift and the address. So that's an example of an audit. And the audits haunt us the most because there's still potential to reconcile. There's still potential to do that thing. Okay. And so that's why we have these different selves, selves that we live with. We have our actual self. That's who we really are, right? Then we have our ideal self. The ideal self is like, this is me doing every single thing that I should absolutely do. And so, you know, the motto of this show is to improve always and always. So one of the things that I'm personally trying to do and what I'm trying to learn from this book is how I can eliminate some of my regrets by instead of just being, you know, my actual self, which is always going to be flawed, is always going to be lacking. And I know that. But I'm going to try to apply the mindset of the oughtas that I ought to do. That this thing, I, this is a thing I ought to do to improve always and always. This is something that I ought to do to make improvement in this area of my life. And go do that thing. Take action so that I can then move closer to my ideal self. You follow me? That's the goal. That's what I'm striving for. And as I'm getting to that that point in the in the book, it talks about how this uh, there was a survey or a, a research that was research that was done at Harvard. I think it was in like 1938, and it was an 80 year study, if I'm not mistaken. It was if it wasn't 80, it was like it was an audacious study, and it had all kinds of flaws because of the time, because of the age, because it was only uh, one race of people. So it had some flaws, but it yielded some pretty amazing data. And here is one of the biggest points that I'll tell you kind of smacked me right in the face. One of the biggest things it found was that over the course of the 80 years, the happiest people with the fewest regrets were those who had good, healthy, loving relationships. And I got to tell you, that's tough for me. Some of my friends that listen to this podcast, you, the, the, the most you have heard from me is this podcast in years probably. And God bless you. Thank you for listening because I am the worst at relationships. But I'm trying to get better. As a matter of fact, Mrs. Wright, I, I invited a, a dear friend of mine uh, to lunch today, which is very unlike me. If you know me, I don't do lunches. I don't do coffees. I, I find that, you know, by saying yes to a lunch, I'm saying no to everything else. So the opportunity costs are just too high. But realizing the importance of relationship and maintaining friendships and not letting friendships go adrift, I'm going to try to re to get close to my ideal self by, inst by taking those autos and making them, I did that. And so I'm, you know, Mrs. Rice said, wow, you're really on a roll. You're calling people, you're reaching out, and you're going to lunch with somebody, wow. And here's why, if there's anyone that can attest to you the benefits of this, it is me. And I'm going to tell you why, okay? And so here's where it's going to get real transparent real fast with old J-Dub, all right? Here we go. I'm, I'm coming at you. So I had been married for almost 17 years to uh, to Carrie, the girl's mom, and for a, a whole host of reasons that some of you know, some of you don't, and it doesn't really matter, uh, we ended the marriage, okay? And I dated one person after we divorced and realized I wasn't going to marry this person, so that was it. I decided I'm going to just be single for the rest of my life. I didn't, I've never dated in my life. Um, I've I've only had uh, my high school sweetheart, my wife, and then that was it. And then dated this one girl, and then now I have Mrs. Wright. And life is grand. But what happened was this. 
I thought, and, I, and the girls used to make fun of me, the girls meaning Rylan and Abby, my daughters, they'd make fun of me because I used to always say the, the, the best life is a lonely, barren existence. Now, I said this tongue-in-cheek. I told them, girls, I want you to find a spouse. I want you to be married. I know that's what you, you want, and that's what I want for you. But for me, being alone is the best thing. So for five years, I didn't date, and I didn't nurture friendships. And here are my big achievements during that, that uh, period of wilderness. I drank a lot of scotch. I watched every episode of Mad Men uh, probably at least three times. I'm pretty sure I watched every episode of The Sopranos. I uh, watched most Curb Your Enthusiasms and started watching uh, Game of Thrones. Couldn't really get into that. Didn't read many books. And here's the, here's the big kicker. All right, you ready for this? Watched. Every single episode of Southern Charm. That's right. If that's not some intellectual uh, exercise, I, if that's not an intellectual exercise, I don't know what it is. Every, oh, 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 did I mention that I paid for the episodes? Yeah, that's right. I went on Prime. I found, I discovered uh, Southern Charm while on an airplane flying to Atlanta. And I was like, oh, this is, Kind of, kind of entertaining. I don't watch reality TV. I've never watched Survivor or any of those. But for some reason, it kind of got to me. And so then I was like, okay, I finished that season. I was like, well, I got to buy all the ones that came before it. So I literally paid for Southern Charm. Now you couldn't pay me to watch that. And if there's one demarcation point that I can tell you where my life completely turned around, it all has to do with relationship and human connection. And here's what happened. So I as I am a real estate broker or that in my past life, I was a real estate broker. I owned real estate brokerages. Um, and I keep my broker's license active because frankly, I don't want to go through the hell of having to get it again. And it's become a lot harder to get a Texas broker's license. And so I, I keep it up to date just in case. And I, I go to get my to to, go, to take some continuing education, which I never did in person. That's that's a weird thing about this. I, I used to never do this in person, but this I do it online, right? But this I thought, well, what what the hell? I mean, I don't. I'm not going to watch Southern Charm right now, and uh, I've already worked out. I got not much else to do, so I'm going to go take this course live. And so I ran into an old friend, and she didn't know I'd been divorced, and she started telling me about this girl that I should, you know, try to connect with. I was like, you know what, Pam. Her name was Pam, the, the the friend. She said, I said, thank you. I appreciate you trying to ma uh, play matchmaker, but I'm out. I've got two girls in my life, Rylan and Abby. They're both, you know, Abby was about to go to college. Rylan was on her way to college. I'm like, I, I'm just, they are my focus. That's it. I don't plan to ever be married again, and I'm not a guy who dates. I, and I, you know, I'm old-fashioned. I'm an old fogey. Judge me all you want, folks. I really don't give a damn. I don't date anyone that I wouldn't consider marrying. That's just how I am. And so I'm like, so therefore, since I'm not going to get married again, not going to date again. And it was that day that I sat there in that class paying absolutely no attention to the instructor that I thought to myself, hmm, at the time, I guess I was 42. And I thought, well, it's easy for me to say right now that I want to be alone for the rest of my life. Because I've got Rylan and Abby, they're young. And for the foreseeable future, you know, I can hang out with them. And even when they get married, I can go stay with them. But then I got to thinking to myself at 65 or 70 years old and thinking, ooh, you know, if I, if I, what if this attitude changes? I can't do much about it at that time. That's going to be, and I didn't have this language at the time because I hadn't read this book, but that would have been a huge shoulda, Right. That would have been a huge, massive shoot. I'm sitting there 70 years old by myself watching Mad Men for the 80th time, looking, you know, still trying to release, unleash my inner Don Draper, except for the uh, all the, the promiscuous sex and the cheating. You know, I'd been, I could go toe to toe with Don back then when I would drink on, um, on old fashions. I didn't smoke, never smoked, but I did like a good old fashioned. I liked scotch back in the day. But at that age, it's like, man, that would be a massive audience. So there was something to it that said, you know, all right, look, 
I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take Pam's advice. And even if nothing happens, and that's kind of, it was really just kind of like this exercise, kind of get me off center, right? Um, so I decided, all right, Pam, ask Jimlin's permission to share her number. And she did. And Jimlin's first take was, because, I mean, Tyler's not that big of a town. It's 100,000 people, right? She knew who I was. I knew who she was. We didn't really know each other. But we knew she knew I was older than her. Um, and I had two almost grown daughters. And her initial, and she had never been married, running a successful business. Kind of the same attitude as me. She had come out of a bad dating relationship. She, her focus was her dog, now our dog, Cotton, and her business. And that was it, right? And she's like, yeah, no. Pam, thanks. He's got daughters almost as old as I am. Seems like a nice guy. You know, I'm very known quantity around here. So she she knew that, yeah, he's a good dude and, you know, reputation solid, but yeah, I'm out. But eventually we connect and you guys know how I feel about Mrs. Wright because I talk about her all the time. I adore her. I mean, she is my hero in a lot of ways, with the exception of Jesus Christ, my savior. Um, she's just the single most amazing human being to ever enter my life. And it com- and all of that comes back to my point with relationships. So I told you that massive list of accomplishments of absorbing really quality content into my brain while I was alone, while I was single, smoking a lot of cigars, still having a cocktail every night after dinner, and watching copious amounts of brain-rotting garbage. I don't know that I, I'm sure, you know, I, I know I had to have read some books during that time because I've always at least had one or two books going, but I mean, it wasn't anything like that. I mean, the point is I was just kind of rotting. I was, I had checked out of any potential I had. I was like, I'm out. I'm just going to live out my days, get the girls through college, move back to Sulphur Springs. I, at one time I had this big grand plan that I was actually going to live in an Airstream on my parents' uh, ranch. Uh, we have a little fishing pond I was going to put on the other side. My dad loved that idea. He's like, oh, you're coming home. We're going to hang out, drink cold beer, and you're going to live in an airstream. I love it. I love that idea. Let's do this. That was my big plan. Fast forward to today. You got the guy that, you know, so I told you it's going to be real transparent. I I'd started the podcast. I re-released my first book, updated. I wrote another book. I never, I mean, watching TV is just not even a part of my protocol. I read a book a week sometimes two and three. I'm constantly trying to improve my mind and improve those people around me. I'm happier. I'm full of joy. And all of that, I I, I just, I would argue till I was blue in the face if someone tried to argue that that didn't have to do with my relationship with Jimlin. Having a person in your life that's bigger than you. And they say one of the things that, you know, throughout this survey that they did on regret, one of the things that hardly anyone ever regrets is having children. Uh, and we know how hard children can be. I, I mean, I'm telling you, there, are, there have been times throughout the course of my fatherhood that I'm like, oh, wow, it's expensive. It's stressful. The, the love you have for them brings an, an element of stress. But here's the thing. It's someone besides yourself that you can place your focus on. Now, I'm not telling everybody to run out and get married. That's not what this is about. But, but, full confession, I was horrible and still struggle with relationships, with friendships. And as I'm trying to go and nail down the autos, so that I can move closer to the ideal self that I want to be, and so that that actual self will be better, then I, I want to work on those relationships. And I can tell you, I am a first-hand account, a testimony of having a person or people in your life that make you better, that lift you up, that challenge you, that and, and, and to the men out there, to the men, we are wired to go into a cave, to go into that dark space alone. We don't want people to see our vulnerability. We don't want people to see that we're miserable. We never want to admit that we're depressed. So we hide. 
we hide in the in in, in the uh, in the office of Don Draper. We hide in the Low Country with Shep and all those other buffoons on Southern Charm. We hide in New Jersey with Tony Soprano. Those aren't real relationships. Those aren't real friendships. They don't know you. Don't care about you. You're never going to meet them. It's getting connected. We are a, we are people who were made to be connected, and it's, I'm telling you, that is a hard thing for me to come to grips with because I like being isolated and alone. I'm an only child. I have half brothers, and I have step siblings, but I was originally an only child, so I've got that only child syndrome. It, it's it's weird. It's like a DNA thing, I think, and uh, and so. I, again, I'm going to do a full uh, review on this book. One, because I always try to do as many book reviews as I can to give people good recommendations. But this one, I just think it's, it's, a, it's a really cool way to look at regret and to take, take inventory of that because I'm telling you, my obsession with eliminating regrets before they ever come so that I don't have to be the psychopath that just convinces myself that I have no regrets. I don't regret anything. Man, it sucked I did that, but what the hell? Eyes forward. Um, I don't want to be that guy. I would rather look back on my life and go, huh, I should have done that. And since I took account of my shouldas, I started checking off as many oughtas as I could. So that now that I'm here at this point in my life, wherever that is, whether it's tomorrow or it's 40 years from now, the oughtas are almost gone. They're checked off the list. The shouldas are left way behind because I made a point to not let the shouldas add up. And then for me, the biggest oughta that I eliminated the shoulda was getting in relationship with an amazing woman, an amazing partner, someone smarter than me, stronger than me, willing to call me on my BS, willing to tell me, hey, you got this. I, I, I'm the most blessed man alive. And it has to do with relationship. So, I hope that you uh, hope that that helped your Friday. I hope that you will take that and you will start to make a point to eliminate those regrets. Just, just get get them out. We don't try to avoid them and don't let your oughtas become shouldas that are no longer able to be overcome. Hey, go check out. The Stone Chiseler, Amazon.com. The Audible version is coming. Go to Audible. Keep looking for it. Please download it. It's a great book. I love it, and I hope you will too. And then also, JasonRightNow.com, The Vitruvian Letter. I'm continuing The Tao of Ben Franklin, that series where we're going through Ben Franklin's 13 virtues. And until we meet again next Tuesday, by the way, I've got an incredible episode, one of the best episodes of The Jason Wright Show coming up next Tuesday. Tuesday. You will not want to miss it. Until then, keep endeavoring to improve always and always. I'm out.